Good morning on this very fine Sunday. Welcome to worship at Cooperstown Presbyterian Church, whether you're here in person or joining us over the net. Uh, welcome. Uh, it's my pleasure this morning to introduce Olivier Zerowali. He is uh, with the Glimmerglass Festival, a uh, young artist, and he'll be performing in Romeo and Juliet and Candide this season. So it's good to have you with us this morning. I'm Peter Craig, and from time to time, I'm occupy the pulpit here. I'm an elder in this congregation and uh, a lay pastor with the uh, Utica Presbytery. Uh, I have an announcement of my own this morning and that is that in two weeks from today we're going to try something different. We're going to have a potluck brunch following the worship service. Weather permitting, it'll be on the lawn in front of the chapel. Uh, so bring a dish to pass and fellowship and, and tables and beverage will be provided. Uh, we hope you can join us for that, for that time together. Uh, what is the news of the congregation this morning? Good morning. Our trunks have arrived in Honduras. Yesterday I received this photograph of the trunks in the home of Olven Duran, our staff member in Honduras. Um, John, would you stand up? And Sue, would you stand up? John packed these trunks in July, and John and Sue put them in their car they are the parts to the water system that will be installed in a medical clinic for malnourished children. So you helped fund this process, and the trunks have arrived with the water system in Honduras. The call to worship. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who has made us. We are his, we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. Our first hymn is number 385. Stand if you are able.
us be bold to come before God, acknowledging that we are and are trusting in his gracious love to lead us into life anew. The prayer of confession. Lord, when things go well for us, we become absorbed in our day-to-day -day lives and forget you. When things are rough, we become undone and are swallowed by our troubles. Come into our hearts and lives that in good times and bad, our lives may be grounded in your amazing love. Hear the good news. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, rich in love. The Lord is good to all and compassionate towards all of creation. Believe this good news and give thanks. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. Hey! <laughs> 
Let us be bold to come before God, acknowledging that we are and trusting in his gracious love to lead us into new life. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. The scriptures are Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 through 22. The rich young man. And behold, one came up to him saying, Teacher, what good deed must I do to have eternal life? And he said to him, Why do you ask me about what is good? Who is good? If you would enter eternal life, keep the commandments. He said to him, Which? And Jesus said, You shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these things I have observed, what do I still lack? And Jesus said to him, go, sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Thank you, Sue. So. I'll be reading this morning from a recent translation of Job by Stephen Mitchell. Now, I've been told by people I trust that it's a very good translation. Not my area of expertise. Even though it's a good translation, you probably won't be able to follow along in your pew Bibles. First, because in the interest of brevity, I'm selecting only a few verses from the listed chapters. And secondly, because even well-intentioned and learned translators have to make choices. Imagine translating from a language with no vowels, no capital letters, no punctuation. And that's just a few of the issues translators of the Hebrew Hebrew texts face. Allowing for all that, I find Mitchell's version to be compelling reading, and I would recommend it to you, the book of Job. Now, I've always been drawn to the book of Job. It has the form of a poetic dialogue between Job, three would-be comforters, and God. The dialogues, not in the form of the back and forth of sentences or even paragraphs, but more like completing statements of a few chapters at a time. Job is a deeply personal book describing Job's faith journey. And he's a compelling character. He's both an ordinary man and an extraordinary man, a righteous man. We encounter him when he was driven to despair by loss and illness, when his confident faith is coming unraveled in the extremity of his circumstances. Now, sometimes the book of Job is presented as addressing the question of why bad things happen to good people. That's a valid discussion, but it won't be my focus this morning. So, as we have it, The main poetic dialogue of the book of Job is framed by a prologue and epilogue in prose. Job was a man of wealth and standing. He had seven sons, three daughters, and many servants. He had 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 donkeys. He was the greatest man in his part of the world. And He was scrupulous in observing God's laws. Some of you may remember that this point 
Satan enters the plot and proposes to test Job's faith, suggesting that Job would renounce God, but for his good fortune in life. Uh, this raises some thorny issues, from which I'm not going to go into this morning, since I've been told to talk for no more than two hours. <laughs> That's right, isn't it? <laughs> and because they're tangential to my focus. So, Job was a great and pious man. Then, through a series of disasters, he loses it all. Family, animals, his wealth, and social standing. Finally, he loses his health. He's afflicted by a loathsome skin disease. Then, it's, as it says, Job took a pot shard with which to scrape himself and sat among the ashes. At this point, his wife, who incidentally was not enumerated among his blessings, his wife says to him, do you still persist in your integrity? Curse God and die. Job responds, shall we receive good at the hand of God and not receive the bad? So despite his misfortune, Job had not sinned against God with his lips. And are the three friends, his would-be comforters, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. I don't know why they didn't become given names of more popularity, but <laughs> there were the three of them. Taken aback by Job's destitution, they sit with him and weep for seven days. Sympathy and presence. That's a good start for someone seeking to bring comfort at a time of loss, but things go downhill. Job starts the conversation off by cursing the day of his birth. He's in a dark place, Job is, but the friends bring a little comfort. And at the heart of their dialogue is a belief that's shared by Job and his friends. That's the belief that what God desires from us is righteousness, faithful obedience to the law. Then, when we do what God desires, we will be rewarded with good fortune. If we don't do as God desires, we'll be punished. Neither Job nor his friends deny the depth of Job's misfortune, so that's not where the disagreement comes in. Where they disagree is whether Job has kept the law faithfully. And Job eloquently maintains that he's lived according to the law. The friends believe that Job hasn't followed the law. Otherwise, why would he be experiencing such misfortune? And Job is steadfast in maintaining his innocence. Now, finally, the reading. This is from the 31st chapter of Job selected verses, just so you get the flavor of it. This is Job speaking. I made a pact with my eyes that I would not gaze at evil, but what good has virtue done me? How has God rewarded me? Isn't disgrace for sinners and misery for the wicked? Can't he tell right from wrong or keep his accounts in order? If ever, I held hands with malice, or my feet hurried to crime. If my legs strayed from the path, or my heart followed my glance, or a stain clung to my palms, let strangers eat what I sowed and tear out my crop by the roots. If my loins were seduced by a woman and I loitered at my neighbor's door, if I scorned the rights of my servant or closed my ears to his plea, if I ever neglected the poor or made the innocent suffer, if I did not clothe the naked or care for the ragged beggar, if I ever excused the helpless, knowing that I could not be punished, ever abused the helpless, knowing that I could not be punished, let my arm fall from my shoulder and my elbow be ripped from its socket. If my land cried out against me, if its furrows saw me and wept, if I took its fruits without paying or caused its tenants to sigh, let thorns grow instead of wheat 
and thistles instead of barley. If I ever trusted in silver, if I ever boasted of my riches, if I laughed when my enemy fell or rejoiced when suffering found him, if I ever covered my crimes or buried my sins in my heart, afraid of what people thought. Ah. Oh, if only God would hear me, state his case against me, let me read his indictment. I would carry it on my shoulder and wear it on my head like a crown. I would justify the least of my actions. I would stand before him like a prince. Job's defense of himself. Job demands justice, justice for himself. Convinced of his innocence, he wishes for a day in court to mount a defense, prove his case. His self-confidence is impressive. I wonder. Let's be clear. He's not demanding a just society or justice for the downtrodden, but justice for himself. I felt like that myself. It's not fair. It's outrageous. She started it. She being my older sister. She always starts it, and now you're punishing me? I can't believe it. Huh. This kind of thinking isn't just for kids, you know. Psychological studies have shown that adults are often already preparing excuses in the middle of their misdeeds. I'm not talking about just hardened criminals. I'm talking about ordinary folks like you and me. It's like we're hardwired to maintain our innocence. Now, if we have the gift of emotional maturity and self-understanding so we can see our failings for what they are, that can be a liberating thing, to confess and move on. But a comprehensive confession, that's a big ask. Consider Job, a man of wealth and power and influence. Prior to all the losses, I'm guessing that Job was pretty self-confident. In my experience, many successful people are like that. Perhaps his time and attention was devoted to his practical matters and he had little inclination for soul searching. The system was working for him. On the other hand, he no doubt had a big role in shaping and maintaining the system in which he prospered. How were all those servants really doing? How about his wife and those dates he loved to eat? Did he really know where they came from? how the date workers lived. Then for us, there are the moral dilemmas we face. We're, there's problems with all the options, but we're forced to choose. Medical ethics, for instance, is full of these dilemmas. Think of the decision to, not to continue care for a dying loved one. It's not black and white. You might think there's really no wrong decision in such a case, but that doesn't, doesn't that imply that there's really no right answer? And it certainly doesn't seem like a, it certainly does seem like a moral decision was called for, and it certainly doesn't mean that you won't wind up second guessing yourself. To me, being a modern human means living in a morally gray world at times. And we have to learn to live with that. And I could go on and on about all the good things I didn't find time to do. So one of the things about Job that raises questions for me is his moral self-confidence. At some level, I feel like I wish he had the moral sensibilities of a modern person. Perhaps that my, that's not entirely fair, fair. It's kind of like wanting to hold the founding fathers morally accountable for owning slaves. On Job's behalf, I would venture that 
within the context of his times and his beliefs, he was actually a morally sensitive person. In the passage we just read, Job gives an interesting and full inventory of the sins, the sins he did not commit. So at least they were on his mind. He had the concepts. He did not disregard the hungry or the sick or the traveler, the widows or orphans. He listens to the complaints of his slaves. He's not trusted in his wealth. He's not rejoiced in his enemy's bad fortune or lusted after women. He's not sought to conceal his misdeeds. So while it's a big ask, I'm inclined to accept Job's assertion that he lived according to the spirit and letter of the law. As for his would-be consolers, who had morphed into tormentors with their insistence that he must have done something wrong, what about them? I think they were off the mark. Job's problem lay not with what he had done, but with the theory that God was primarily interested in our obedience to the law. Both Job and his interlocutors saw God as giving them a to-do list and then keeping track of debits and credits, good deeds, and failings, then passing out rewards and punishments. It wasn't just Job and his companions that thought like that. A lot of people thought of God in that way. It was the popular wisdom. It passed for common sense. I'd call it the received view. In fact, some people still think like that. At times, Job's feeling of entitlement is palpable. It was as if he had to, had to deal with God. Job felt that he had fulfilled his side of the contract, and now Job wanted to take God to court for not holding up his side of the bargain. That legal language really runs through the book of Job until it doesn't. Up to this point, Job had not received any reply to his self-defense. Finding no comfort from his would-be friends and feeling abandoned by God, Job's self-confidence was shaken, and he had become self-absorbed. Suffering and loss and grief can do that, make it hard to keep a sense of perspective. It was as if Job's world the world for Job revolved around him and his problems. In the extremity of his circumstances, and focused increasingly on himself and his pain, Job had been doing all the talking. Job's patience with God was running out, and it showed. Exasperated, he'd lost any sense of deference and humility. By the way, you should forget about the patience of Job. That's mentioned in the book of James. Personally, I think that must have referred to some other Job. So, at last, Job enters the dialogue. Enter God. Sounds, lights, atmospheric effects. Reading from Job 38 and 40 now. Then God answered Job from within the whirlwind. Who is this whose ignorant words smear my design with darkness? Stand up now like a man, I will question you. Please instruct me. See, it's the court. Where were you when I planned the earth? Tell me if you are so wise. Do you know, do you know who took its dimensions, measuring its length with a cord? What were its pillars built on? Who laid the, down its cornerstone while the morning stars burst out singing and the angels shouted for joy? Were you there when I stopped the waters as they issued gushing from the womb, when I wrapped the ocean in clouds and swallowed the sea? in shadows, 
when I closed it in with barriers and set its boundaries, saying, here you may come, but no farther. Here shall your proud waves break. And he goes on like that for quite a ways. He describes the creation of all the, the beasts and birds, the antelope, the wild ass, the wild ox, the ostrich, the war horse, the hawk. Finally, after this recitation, he turns to Job. Has God's accuser resigned? Has my critic swallowed his tongue? And Job replies, I'm speechless. What can I, what can I answer? I put my hand on my mouth. I've said too much already. Now I will speak no more. Then God goes on. Do you dare to deny my judgment? Am I wrong because you are right? Is your arm like the arm of God? Can your voice bellow like mine? Dress yourself up like an emperor. Climb up onto your throne. Unleash your savage justice. Cut down the rich and mighty. Make the proud man grovel. Pluck the wicked from their perch. Push them into the grave. Throw them screaming to hell. Then I will admit that your own strength can save you. Talks about Leviathan, the serpent, and behemoth. Then finally, Job says to God, I know you can do all things, and nothing you wish is impossible. I've spoken the unspeakable and tried to grasp the infinite. I've heard you with my ears, but I had heard you with my ears, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I will be quiet, comforted that I am dust. So, Job experiences God face to face, as it were. Up to that time, Job had known God only through what he had heard. Now, God responds finally to Job out of a whirlwind. Well, sort of. This is not another round of theological back and forth. Actually, God does not answer Job's question, the one about what Job had done wrong. Instead, the Lord posed a series of his own questions to Job, questions which could only be answered by the Creator. The questions, of course, are rhetorical. The Lord does not communicate in the abstract language of theology. Instead, he reminds Job of the immensity of his creative work, its height and breadth and depth. He describes the powerful chaotic forces of nature harnessed by his ordering and his detailed design of creation. His far-reaching knowledge, the scope of his activity, as creator are described, then, then the Lord invites Job's response. And receiving none, he asked Job, as my critic swallowed his tongue. And Job replies, I am speechless. What can I answer? I've said too much already. Now I will say no more. Job's silence signifies a revolutionary change of attitude. So, how do you feel about God's response to Job's suffering and the questions it created for Job? I think some people might feel that Job's, God's response is very unsatisfactory. It's kind of an evasive beatdown of a faithful man who dared to ask difficult questions of God. Actually, on second thought, I think God needed to address Job's impertinence. 
Actually, God was showing Job a way forward. Now, even in good times, it seems only natural that you and I should be at the center of our universe. Who better than ourselves to keep track of and attend to our affairs? Trouble is, we can lose all sense of proportion while we are tracking and attending to our affairs. On the other hand, we look at an ant and think how small, how insignificant in the overall scheme of things. Yet in the immensity of God's creation, among the multitudes of God's creatures, we are small and few. Do we understand the laws that defines the workings of God's creation? Surely that better than we did in Job's day, but the more we learn, the more we grasp the magnitude of our ignorance and the magnitude of God's works. So when we come before God in prayer or worship, an attitude of awe and humility is in order. We should be prepared to listen as well as talk. We should be open to new, transformative understandings. We should remember that for God, it's not all about just me or you. Humility. Humility has many aspects and they're all tough because they involve holding our egos in check. There's a humility which causes us to bow before God, the humility necessary for necessary so for self-examination and confession. And there's the humility which eases human relationships. There's also what I would like to call intellectual humility, the ability to recognize that our cherished ideas and values may not be completely correct. Job, for instance, clung to the received view to understand his relationship to God. What he really needed was to think outside that box, but he was stuck, stuck in his thinking. He was obsessed, unable to see beyond matters of innocence and guilt, incurred rewards and punishments, and then he encountered God in the whirlwind, and the old issues got resized. What had seemed important was forgotten. The old obsession was laid to rest. But to receive view, the mindset of entitlement was blown away in the whirlwind. What had seemed important now seemed much less so. God was too great for God to sustain a claim against him. The Lord of the Prologue, think back to my introduction. The Lord of the Prologue had shown special affection for Job. There's no one like him on the earth, he said, a man of perfect integrity who fears God and avoids evil. But Job had kept silence through all Job's demands for a day in court. God had all through, through all of that, God had not abandoned Job, however. And Job's experience of God in the whirlwind put an end to his feeling of being abandoned. Job was able to see that God bore him goodwill and had the power to shape creation and planned for his creation, creatures. His creatures were not in a position to make demands on God nor would they be able to comprehend the manifold wonders of creation. Job needed to know that God loved him and that he had a place in God's world. Knowing the big picture, he would have to take the details on faith. The received view with its punishments and entitlements was not the key to understanding Job's place in God's world. Once, once upon a time, Job had assumed that his good fortune was a reward for his diligence in following the law. There's a corollary to that understanding, to the understanding that suffering is not God's punishment for misdeeds. It is that human prospering 
is not God's reward for our good deeds. Human flourishing is rooted in God's grace. Now, you won't find the word grace in the story of Job, but I would suggest that by exposing the limits of the received view, Job opens up a place in our hearts to receive the good news of God's grace. The pro, I, I mentioned earlier that there's a prose prologue, and then there's also a prose epilogue. And that epilogue describes how Job was restored material, materially and spiritually to a life of abundance. I have to believe that Job himself was not the same. In my mind, in my mind's eye, he was changed from being a righteous man to being a gracious man. There's all the difference in the world. Thank you. Now is the time when we receive our offering. Freely have you received, freely give. Let us return to God the offering of our life and the gifts of the earth.
we offer these gifts, Lord, with the hope and trust that they will be used in the furtherance of your kingdom. May they become vehicles of your love to our hurting world. Amen. This is the time when we share our joys and concerns. Uh, what would you like to share this morning? Jim will be bringing around the microphone so you can hear, so that we can all hear. I ask for prayers for my cousin, Corinne Valentine. Uh, a couple months ago, I reported that uh, she had celebrated her 40th birthday, uh, which was a wonderful milestone. She was born with spina bifida. Uh, she is really uh, struggling now with multiple health complications, so I appreciate your prayers. Anyone else? Ah. Um, I would like to express a joy. I had the pleasure of um, having my son Jason and my grandson Arwen from California with me this past week. Um, now they're off to Florida to catch up with other parts of the family. Um, and a concern, please keep my mom, Anna, in your prayers. She's still having a difficult time in rehab with balance and sodium issues, low sodium issues. Thank you. I uh, received word from Presbytery that Larry Beasley, our executive presbyter, has uh, fallen and fractured his fibula. And he's uh, expecting surgery later this week. So please keep him in your prayers as well. Uh, also, my sister is uh, dealing with a fall by her husband who is now in rehab, so uh, please pray for Millie and her family. Shall we join in prayer? Lord, we pray for those who are ill in body and spirit. Give us eyes to notice them in their pain and show us how to reach out to them with your love and your peace. Be with our caregivers, give them wisdom and endurance when it is hard to know what to do and when their commitment is open-ended. Show us how to be with those who grieve that we may walk with them in their hard times. And we pray for those who are lonely and isolated. We pray for our community and our nation in these divisive times. Give us sympathy and understanding for those whose lives are different from ours, that we may come together and make common cause to address the problems of our days. And we pray for your church the Church Universal, and for this congregation. Give us imagination and energy and vision that we may carry your word and exhibit your kingdom to our needy world. All these things we ask in Jesus' name, who taught us when we pray to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done 
on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now let us join in singing hymn 30, O God in a Mysterious Way. serve the Lord. Amen.